Welcome and good evening everyone. My name is Tamsin Golding Yi and I'd like to introduce you to tonight's event, Looking Back, Looking Forward, Decolonising the Museum on behalf of the MA Curating Group at the Courtauld. As part of our course, we deliver two public debates around contemporary and pressing issues in the museum sector, together organising the topic and questions and inviting a chair and speakers. Today, we focus on the subject of decolonising the museum. We believe this is something crucial to decolonising efforts at large due to the museum's unique role in visualising past and presence and shaping notions of identity and inclusivity. We felt that this topic was particularly timely and important in light of recent events, as we see post-colonialism and decolonising efforts that have been active for years enter into a new kind of public and political sphere. Described by some as a culture war, today, this conversation has been complicated by the UK government's recent announcement of their retain and explain policy, which limits cultural institutions' as approaches in displaying objects with contested histories and multiple heritages. At the same time, we are seeing the disproportionate effect of COVID on black, Asian and other ethnic minority communities. And over the past year, wider structures of injustice have been revealed on a global scale particularly by the Black Lives Matter movement. In response to this accumu accumulation of factors, museums, galleries and cultural institutions have issued statements of solidarity and pledges to do better, to decolonize and diversify their collections and institutions to greater degrees. In this debate, we will pose the questions, how is the best way to do that? And does the most sustainable change come from inside or outside the museum's walls? Moreover, is a truly decolonized museum even possible? Our four panelists this evening are from diverse backgrounds and between them have a wealth of experience working independently and institutionally within the art world. Firstly, Dr. Nima Puvea smith is a curator, art historian and writer, notable for her work with transcultural and South Asian art at Cartwright Hall Art Gallery in Bradford. She is joined by Alice Proctor, who is an art historian, the organizer of the Uncomfortable Art Tours and author of The Whole Picture, exposing the insidious co colonial legacies of many major culture institutions in the UK. Our third speaker is Erica Tan, an artist whose practice and research focuses on the post-colonial and transnational movement of ideas, people and objects. She is currently the Stanley Picker Fellow in Fine Art and a lecturer and part of the Decolonising Arts Institute at the University of Arts London. Michael Ohojuru is a writer, blogger and speaker on the back presence within the Renaissance Europe and a senior fellow of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Just to note that we are really keen for this event to be as much of a dialogue as possible and we will open the chat on Zoom nearer the end of the discussion for the audience to submit questions for the chair and the panellists. I'm now pleased to introduce the chair of this debate, Dr. David DeBosa. David is a curator and co-investigator of the Black Artists and Modernism and has worked on multiple public art projects. He is also the course leader of the University of the Arts London MA programme, Curating and Collections. So without further ado, I will now hand over to David. Thank you so much, Tamsin, for that warm introduction. And thank you also to Alice and Julia and other members of your team for giving us this opportunity this evening to raise these deep and prevailing questions in relation to culture. I think now is a time where we have the opportunity to deal with issues which have in some cases been occupying thinkers, curators, artists for perhaps even up to a century. So I'm grateful to you and to your team for uh, bringing together this incredible panel, this wealth of experience to address some of these issues. I believe we will have a deep and uh, provoking debate. In terms of provocation, I'm delighted that we start with a, a poem uh, by a writer, by the Booker Laureate Ben Oakley, whose work um, has fascinated not just literary audiences for many years, but indeed has ranged against a series of critical and historical 
questions, not just in relation to Nigeria, which is a country which I know he's written about in great detail from his wonderful work, The, the Famished Road, but onwards to talk about a whole series of cultural debates. And for this evening, although Ben can't be with us at the end, other end of the camera, he has uh, given us this uh, recording as a uh, provocation in order to think about some of these issues uh, relating to decolonization. The poem I'm going to read is called Decolonization from my new book of poems, A Fire My Head. Decolonization from Fanon. It never takes place unnoticed, like a blade before your eyes. It transforms those crushed with their nothingness into central performers under the flood light of history's blood-like gaze. A new rhythm by due men brought, a language new minted from the old earth, a humanity remade by vaporizing chains and the brutal alembic of oppression. It's the way new beings are forged from fire and rage, distilled into clear dawn. But nothing supernatural presides over this renewal. No deities or heroes or famed individuals. The new becomes being the same way it became Free. Well, I just wanted uh, I just wanted you to listen to the poem and let the poem speak for itself and speak to your theme. Um, and one of your themes is uh, is has to do with decolonizing uh, museums around the world, which has to begin, in my mind, with. Uh, decolonizing people's uh, minds and their thoughts, their attitudes, their perception of their histories. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a mutual liberation. It's, it's um, one of the most important things that we have to do now as in cultural institutions, uh, in corporations and governments, nations, um, universities, and even as individuals. I think it's one of the most urgent things because it begins to clear the way for um, a truer and a, a freer way of perceiving one another, our art, our lives, our futures, our histories. We need to transfigure, transform all manner of um, unacceptable perceptions in the past and restore something of the dignity of the human to humanity. And this is how it starts. Sometimes it starts with art and sometimes it starts in life. And this poem addresses both. It's worth remembering though that there are many kinds of decolonization and there are many ways in which it persists. And so I hope that your debate is rigorous um, and clear and unclouded by sentiment um, or self-protection or any kind of uh, personal bias. We need to liberate one another. What a wonderful provocation there from Ben Oakley and a, a real challenge for us to look towards that sense of uh, liberty, that sense of dignity that he's asking us to restore to ourselves. Um, I certainly was uh, noted the way in which he referred to Franz Fanon, um, and as I begin to go to our, our panelists in a moment, I just wanted to hold one thought for us is in relation to the way in which writers such as Fanon are being discussed at the moment. And certainly it's one thing to note that uh, his work, The Wretched of the Earth, Damne de la Terre, some people know it by that title, is a work which was quite uncompromising in relation to its call for violence and the ways in which previously Fanon's work has been uh, referred to in, in, in much more uh, nuanced ways. But the reference to Fanon there, I think was quite a challenge. And I certainly took from the poem 
this, uh, this point about things being forged from fire and rage. Fire and rage. These are aspects that we've seen in relation to decolonization. But I'm wondering where they take us now, certainly in relation to our own field. I'm going to go over to Michael just for a few uh, references to how you responded, Michael, to, um, to Ben's poem. Very, very powerful. Ben O'Cree. I've always found his work challenging because he's deep and you have to read, read, read into it. And there was, a, there was a phrase that really jumped out at me there the brutal al alembic of oppression. Now, it, it, it struck me that, that that word alembic, I'd forgotten that word. You know, it's a word that was back in chemistry, back in. Back in the day uh, word. And it got me thinking, because alembic, it's a dual word. It's, it's Arabic and it's Greek. It's that fusion. And I'm loving that. I love those kind of connections you see in words. And when he goes on to talk about the alembic oppression, how a tough. Michael, I'm afraid we're losing you a little bit. I certainly am. So I'm going to come back to you in relation to, because we're just enjoying this uh, take on alembic and the ways in which you're talking about, there's a kind of uh, archeology, span if you like, a political archeology span that we're doing there in relation to, to those terms. Hopefully our uh, technical wizards will be back to get you back on, on screen. But before that, maybe I can go to Alice and ask Alice in relation to uh, your take on uh, Ben's, Ben's work what, what what were some of your thoughts yeah I mean it's hard to say anything about it because as Michael was saying it needs a lot of time and space to think about and I appreciated Ben's provocations for us at the end asking us to just sort of be with it for a while um, from when I first read it a couple of days ago to now the phrase that I keep coming back to is uh, history's blood light gaze under the floodlight of history's blood light gaze and I find this idea of a need for violence and a need for intensity very important when we're talking about understanding colonial history and histories of cruelty and oppression as well is that we have to recognize that acts of violence in the past will be met with some kind of catharsis in the present um i yeah i just keep coming back to that phrase and I wondered if other people had thoughts on it as well, because I certainly find the reflection on any kind of history or any sort of time spent with commemoration to be essentially bloody. Um, it's something that takes a lot of, can take a lot out of you as a historian or as an archivist. And there's a very real sense in which we need to recognize that any sort of historical excavation or historical work is going to be painful to some extent and everyone will experience or feel that to a different degree. Mm. Um, Thank you so much, Alice, particularly these terms in terms of catharsis and pain. And I know that uh, other uh, panel members will have something to say to that. Michael, we'll come back to you in a moment. We'll just make sure that we've got that link established. But Nima, I'm gonna go over to you because certainly in terms of your, the history of your work, Nima, you must have uh, had to deal with some of these questions, not just in terms of the, the smoky back rooms of policy and politics, but also in terms of facing some of the questions and challenges that are, that are posed to us in terms of this decolonizing project. Over to you, Nima, what, what are your thoughts? I'd just like to say very quickly in response to Ben Okri's poem, a marvelous poem, and also its ability, and that's poetry's ability, isn't it? to compress vast things, to conflate them down and give us very succinct truths. And I discovered a long time ago that when I came up with you know, complex or complicated concepts, if I wanted it explicated to an audience, always commission a poet because they do the job marvelously well. Okay, so uh, David, just go back to your question. I, I've, I've forgotten some details of it because you wanted to know how I dealt with the complexities of the politics. Well, let's come back to that, Nima, actually. Let's come back to that yeah. because I think you've really brought us back to the poem. And I think maybe we'll, I'll go back to Michael and I know, Erica, you've got some images you want to share with us. So let's go to Michael because Michael, I think yes. we've got a stable connection with you now. Let's just hear a bit more that you were saying about uh, Alembic. Yeah, we talked about, and Ben spoke about the brutal alembic of oppression. The brutal alembic of oppression. The fact that, that 
you've been distilled and that's made you better. That made you a, a, a tougher, harder, a, 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 a more a person who wants to fight. I'm minded of uh, Nietzsche. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger because we've been through it. So when we see how, the, how our, our, in, of our identity has been brutalized in these in museums around the world, it, that, make, that, that energizes us to get involved and to take possession of it, to own it. And I see it as a driving force, particularly, you know, just look at this recent work by um, Ben Hicks, the British Museums. And British Museum, and you see what the, the Britain did in Benin well, to get those to get those, uh, those Benin bronzes with a Gatling gun. A Gatling gun killed a Gatling gun six hundred people a minute, and they had five of them. It was brutal, and, and, and that sense of pain, hurt, and loss is there in the blood. And he talks about the blood in the poem. It's all there. So no powerful stuff by him. You know, and you know, as I say, that, that Nietzsche. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And I'm more determined now than ever that, 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 we, that we should do, should we, we should own those things that the, museum have, that the museums have taken possession of and see, and see through their lens. We need to see it through our lens, through different lenses, not, not just the, 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 say, the, the white, male, pale and stale lens, but there's others, you know, there's other lenses. And I'm going to be part of that. So powerful stuff, powerful stuff. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. And you did refer there to, to museums and to Dan Hicks' work, which I know a lot of, lot of people are reading at the moment. Now, I know, Erica, you had some images to, to share with us. So I'm hoping that our technical yeah. uh, wizards uh, around the, around, distributed around the world are going to be able to do that. Wonderful. And I know you wanted to talk yeah. to us a little bit about work. So over to you, okay. Erica. So so I hope you can see that. Um, I'm just trying to make the image as big as possible. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of responding to the question of um, we, questions that we were sent out um, earlier. And the starting point was, you know, what does decolonizing mean to you, which is a really huge um, kind of question for me. Um, and I was trying to think about it quite simply. And I suppose simply there's two things for me. It's acknowledging the continuities of colonial and imperial processes, tools and relationships in our current practices, disciplines, organizations and institutions. And then two, it's doing something about it somehow, trying to develop, this is for me as an artist, is developing a kind of praxis of learning and unlearning um, and holding um, things and people and systems to account. There's something in the poem, um, well, the word rhythm, new rhythms to me, is quite optimistic because what I found in a lot of my practices is that um, in the process of researching and making work, um, for me, I've always been um, concerned about the, the, the rhythms and the patterns that I see that are repeated over and over again. Um, and so um, maybe I'm not as optimistic about what that new rhythm might be. Um, but it's recognizing where that old rhythm still exists. So this is just uh, what I wanted to do was to sort of um, put us straight into a, a particular museum, a particular context. Um, and this um, museum here is uh, Perak Museum, which is the first museum um, that was established in, in Malaysia or Malaya. Um, and I came across well, I was doing research um, around a topic called Repatriating the Object with No Shadow. It was a series of works. Um, and one of the museums I was looking at was at the, the museum in Taiping, the Perak Museum. Now, this museum um, was built in 1883 by the British, and it was built just a few years after the first jail was built in Malaysia in the same town. This town is really known for all a, a whole series of firsts. But what was interesting for me is that the museum was built right opposite to the jail um, and just in a few uh, years um, apart and so on the one hand the jail incarcerates bodies and the other the museum incarcerates objects. Um, the development of the museum in Taiping was seen as an integral part of the British colonial infrastructure development. Um, it exists alongside the building of um, various other locations so I'll just quickly show you some more detailed images that was then. Um, this is now and these are some of the other um, establishments. So um, building a clock tower, um, a way of ordering and standardizing time, um, building um, educational institutions to um, build up a sort of workforce. Um, 
uh, the police force to enforce order and railway lines and stations to facilitate the extraction of resources and parade grounds to display colonial pomp and circumstance and military force. So the museum is alongside all these infrastructural developments. It's completely part and parcel of the colonial um, enterprise. In terms of the museum's collections itself, it was built around the idea of gathering knowledge through collecting primarily for flora and fauna, but also cultural objects. So here's just an example of a list of um, one particular exhibition that wasn't in Taiping Museum, but it's a particular exhibition. And there's hundreds of um, animals um, that were on display and later on sent back to England. Um, so, so yes, anyway, hundreds and thousands of materials were collected um, in Taiping Museum and they were sent from there to Britain, to places like the British Museum and the Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. Much of this material has to this day never actually publicly ever been seen or displayed. Um, but all of this material has been removed from its original location and undergone a process of displacement, taxonomic realignment and standardization. So what's interesting to me is the way in which um, it is kind of impossible in Taiping to stand inside the museum and not be aware of the building and the collection's colonial histories. But the reverse cannot be said. If you're standing inside the British Museum, you're not made aware of Taiping and the Perak Museum and that history that's involved there. It is invisible. Um, but in both places, these histories aren't, um, aren't ever told. They're not explicitly um, told. Um, you might find them in the records, colonial archives, but they're not otherwise readily available. So I thought that was interesting. And I also wanted to bring um, this quote kind of up from um, Ariella Azule. It is not, well, actually, I want to say something first about what she says about museums, and she calls them shrines um, of imperialism, um, and seeing them as celebrating and upholding imperial violence enacted on other bodies and other cultures. Museums archives and archives are often perceived as benign as centers for knowledge as if this knowledge might be considered neutral but this so-called knowledge is built upon the expropriation of object people and ideas the museum or unreflexive museum is fundamentally a continuity of the colonial tool for extraction of resources information and the maintenance of power or hierarchical relationships so for me um, it's not necessarily that the museum should be dismantled um, and I say that because perhaps I'm unsure how to fully dismantle it, but also I'm really aware as a maker how much I've benefited and my practice has benefited from engaging with um, these systems and these structures and also these objects. Um, I also wonder if we returned all the objects, where would they go? Would they be wanted? Um, is there somewhere to go back to or has it been irreversibly altered? Um, and Equally, I will very quickly come to an end. Um, what systems do they go into? Um, as an interim, could we reimagine the museum less as a shrine of imperialism, more a critical witness to colonial histories that need to be made more apparent, visible, and part of the discourse around these objects and the way that we perceive them? So That's I'll end great. With that quote. Erica, I didn't want to rush you because you just said so much. And what I was really trying to do is to just get it in bite sized pieces so we get the opportunity to really think through and consider so many of the provocations that you that you raised here um now um i just wanted to because you did talk about this question as to whether we can decolonize the the museum and what might the strategies be for that and i do know that nima in terms of your own work you've worked very much at the uh if you like, really at the heart of what practice means in relation to this, as well as um, getting Erica, your your view as an artist and your artistic practice from museum practice point of view. Nima, what, what does decolonization mean to you? Well, it is resetting the lens of history. So you get a much richer perspective. And it also means that our you know, knowledge capital is increased tenfold. How can it not? Because you're getting a contextualized history and also insights into things that you didn't, most people didn't know before. And from a museum's point of view, the objects suddenly take on a new life, a new richness. And that's what it meant to me right from the start. I didn't use words like decolonizing when I started, obviously. You know, there were precursors to this, but I always looked at it from that point of view. How can you not share my excitement? And most people were too polite to say that they didn't. And so that allowed me a way in to start, you know, doing things. 
And right from the off, decol decolonizing for me, there were, even as a, a rookie curator, I knew that the process had to be dialogic. I knew that the meanings had to come working in consultation with a group of other people from other disciplines and the public. I also knew it had to be polyvocal. It had to have multiple voices in, in terms of interpretation. And I also realized very quickly that it also needed uh, some kind of editorial choreography in order for it to be a coherent narrative. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And I really took on board um, what Erica had been saying and the way that um, was reflected in your own uh, question there and your, your own response, because Erica kind of very uh, neatly put together through that example from Malay, the um, juxtaposition of the, the museum, we have the birth of the museum, of course, the, the, the uh, Tony Bennett work, and of course, the Michel Foucault work on the birth of the prison, that, that deliberate, uh, if you like, comparison, um, parallel between those two, the two institutions. Um, and there you talk very much again about, I guess, the ways of working from within the institution, working from the inside. And I just wondered if I could carry that point over to Alice in terms of thinking about art history. Um, because of course there are these um, positions and if you like provocative positions that some people take in saying that um, art history cannot be decolonized. It is as much as the, the museum was in, in Malay, a colonial structure. What, 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 what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I do think that art history is essentially very colonial in the way that it's created as a discipline. I think that entanglement with the history of museums, the history of galleries and collecting in particular is something that we can't get away from. I feel like trying to talk about decolonizing art history is sort of running before you can walk though, because as a sector and as a discipline, I think museums and galleries in particular the art spaces that don't necessarily consider themselves to be keepers of imperialism need to do some really deep reflection <laughs> on what that means and the implications of that before they can start. There's been this real tendency to use the idea of decolonizing the museum as a bit of a buzzword and that has its problems. On the one hand, I think it's really interesting and quite important that the conversation about the idea of colonialism and therefore decoloniality has come into the mainstream but at the same time, that means that our sort of understanding of it has been dramatically simplified back down to the sort of barest structure of what colonialism in, its, in an institution means. And so for me, the discipline of art history in particular, of anthropology, of museum studies, needs to take a little bit more time <laughs> to get to the point where decolonization is even aspirational. Um, as someone who works on museums primarily from the outside. I think I am able to say that uh, without fear of losing my job, but I recognize that there are significant numbers of people on the inside of these institutions that are doing this work as well and that are pushing in a really significant and really dramatic way from inside and that there needs to be this kind of push and pull in all directions when it comes to challenging these institutions. Great, thank you so much, Alice. I mean, I really take on board the point that you're making there about working both inside or outside the museum and what one's position is and how important it is to think about one's position. I, I, I want to talk to Michael because Michael is certainly someone who's uh, ranged between different disciplines and certainly as an historian, uh, Michael, I'm sure these kinds of questions have, have come up for you. Um, and I'm just actually just wondering if we can go to Michael because we seem to have just technically lost. So maybe you can go back to that question about history with Michael when we get to the, the technical uh, issues sorted out there. But uh, certainly Erica, in terms of the work that you showed us, there is definitely a question in relation to, um, if you like, the sedimentation of history, not just the, the work and the practices that have taken place, but how they're recorded and what the record is there. So in relation to your own work and the record of your work, in terms of the critical engagement with your work, do you see that these questions around decolonization, around um, this, uh, if you like, the accrual of violence, which I think is something that you suggested within, within your work, something, a legacy that we have to take responsibility for. Obviously, as an artist, this is something you're cognizant of. But in terms of the reception of your work and in terms of the critical response to your work, do you find 
that that debate is live there as well. You may need to unmute yourself as well, Erica. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, sort of, I, I think I've kind of gone blank you, because uh, as an artist, when you say, what is the critical reception to your work? It's a bit like, uh, um, is there any critical engagement with my work? Yes. You know, is, is there? There <laughs> is. Am I, to? Am I talking to myself? Um, I think for me, it's less about when the work's made and that critical engagement, but the process of making um, often puts me into positions with um, institutions and organizations. And so it's that critical engagement that I find interesting, but also taxing and difficult because as an outsider, um, you're having to understand this whole new culture or this culture of an institution, um, which is not transparent to you. Um, and it's really only in the process of trying to make things and do things that um, it starts unraveling and you become aware of um, where you're located and how the systems op operate. Um, so I've, I've swerved your question completely, um, but it is sort of talking about this inside, outside and what you come across and, and what's possible. Um, I, I, if we kind of move on to that, I don't mind showing you a couple of more images for something else, but we can come back to that. Yeah, let, let's come back to that. But thank you very much, first of all, for such a successful swerve. And you swerved in such a, a, a good direction, an effective direction, because I think this kind of question of how an artist is placed or received within an institution also helps us to talk about where we're all differentially located in relation to institutions, whether as historians, as art historians, as artists, as uh, curatorial students, as critics, um, always with these changing sets of relations to the institution. I'm going to see if we can go back to, to Michael to, to ask about this question about his, him as an historian or him moving through and across different disciplines, different interventions that I know you've done over the years, Michael. I mean, what are your reflections on on this, uh, how one responds to institutions and what institutions actually do as we try to engage these strategies. First, I'd just like to say, this is a really exciting time to be an art historian. You know, there's so many opportunities in terms of you know, the buzzword intersectionality, you know, in terms of race, gender, age, disability, so many ways we can look at art, so many ways into art and understanding it. What I'm finding exciting is that on this deep breath, museums are open to this. Maybe not as fast or as big as we would like, but they are understanding that these changes are happening around them and they, are, they want to give different lenses, different ways into the museums. Our challenge is that they don't have enough people of the right mindset to actually at the highest level to do it at the right speed. Change is, hit, is happening. This so-called diversity is happening and diversity as a verb. The, the museums are being active. For me, I'm, I'm like Alice. I, I think that you know, they, they've got the, the button, but they're not just waking, so they're not waking fast enough. They are the new thing. And I'm, daily I'm intrigued as I look at an, an art. I see just in little things how the name of a, a, a painting has changed. Like there was a called Michael, the Black Slave by a known French artist from the, we're losing you a little bit, Michael, so right. I'm just going to jump in because I think you've said a, a lot there which we can work with and to, and while we work to get your connection back. Um, because you did talk about how museums are open and how there are agents of change within, within the museums. And I just want to ask a little bit about this question about where this agency of change is. Who are these agents of change within museums or, out, or outside of them? Is it curators? Is it artists, activists, researchers, librarians, archivists? Where should we be looking both within and outside museums in terms of agency of change? I'm gonna to go to Nima first and then see if we can come back to you, Michael. And I know, Erica, you've got some images you want to share with us. So we'll, we'll come back to those in a moment. But Nima, please, because... Um... I would say all of those uh, categories that you have listed are agents of change. You do need curators who are creative, courageous and confident, none of which I was, I hasten to add. Uh, but you also need institutional will up to a point. Uh, well. You need institutional goodwill for a great deal. You don't always get it. And the public, the public can be massive agents of change. 
And also we should not underestimate the level of public knowledge, you know, in terms of understanding the nuances of these things. They're always far more sophisticated, I found in Bradford than people usually gave them credit for. And then artists also very, very important uh, because their narratives always tend to challenge the dominant narratives of real politic. So they have a way of addressing these things in a manner that perhaps curators can't do. So I find artists as important. And then I think all the other related disciplines, because I'm very, very interested. Michael used the word intersectionality. I'm very interested in multidisciplinarity because again, when we approach something as vast and complex as decolonizing, I think it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. And again, finally, interestingly enough, it is also an international thing in terms of agents of change. I found that you know, dealing with things about the diaspora without engaging uh, the subcontinent or the African and Caribbean countries, you know, as was uh, uh, very, very relevant, also made for a rather incomplete and a more impoverished picture. Uh, so it, it does take a huge effort. You can't do it all you know, at once, as Erica said. It is complex, it is complicated, but I think uh, the agents of change, some of them, you know, have their moment and then, you know, they, they, they come down. And then uh, but throughout it all, I think the curator has to really uh, play quite a, a, a driving role. And that's the thing that scares me, David, if I may say so, that you may have the best policies on earth, but so much depends on the individual. And if an individual decides to depart, things can you know, fall apart. And I don't, I, that was an unconscious quote from Juno Archibald's title, but you see what I mean. Thank you so much, Nemo. And we're kind of definitely weaving between the literary and the art historical, the critical in order to, to address these debates. Um, I want to just ask, Alice in terms of the art historian and then we're going to come to Erica give Erica time to line up the pictures because I think you're so right about the the artists Nima and um, we're lucky enough to have an artist here uh, with us who does have critical acclaim or certainly in my circles anyway we spend a lot of time talking about your work Erica so we'll come come to you in a moment but Alice please um where, how do you, how far do you recognize this, this picture that Nima's presenting and, and where in your view are, are the effective agents of change operating at the moment? I think Nima's completely right. And every group and individual that you've mentioned is an important part of this. I'd also say we tend to talk about the curators and I quite like to go into bat for the education teams at these institutions and say that a lot of the time, a huge amount of the work that's going on in terms of challenging what's on display, what's sort of taken for granted within these institutions is coming from educators. And often that's because they're a group that works very directly with the public. It's impossible to not notice how desperate the sort of desire and appetite for these kind of quote unquote challenging conversations is if you're working with school kids every day or if you're working with families and adults that are coming in to try and see these objects and understand them. And in my experience, a huge amount of the drive to challenge or confront or adapt these institutions has come from people working in the education teams as frontline staff, but also in managerial positions because they recognize very immediately that they need to change to suit an audience and to kind of respond to demand. So I always like to support the educators in that. <laughs> and that is because I used to be one. Um, I think for Absolutely. art historians as well, there's an interesting shift happening in terms of recognizing that the public impact of work needs to be kind of part of the driving force behind it. I am still very aware of a number of academic institutions and museums and galleries as well that are quite willing to go ahead with their standard research projects without necessarily thinking through how that's going to be communicated to the public at the end of it. I'm also a big fan of bringing in a poet or bringing in an artist as someone who can work as a bit of an intermediary there and translate that. But I would also say that part of this process needs to come from the academics and the researchers recognizing that there is an appetite for the work that they're doing. I know so many people that are doing really brilliant, really deep and insightful work on these archives and these collections, and it just never sees the light of day. Most of the time that's due to the internal politics of these institutions, but 
if we're thinking about intersectionality, there needs to be a greater sense of solidarity and collaboration between the departments in these institutions, between the researchers, the curators, and the front of house people and the educators, because if they know about your research, they will get it out there. Lovely, thank you so much, Alice. And um, we have here uh, someone, uh, Erica, you've worked, you've worked, you're a researcher, you're an academic, you're also an artist, so you've worked across these, these disciplines. I know you wanted to share some images with us. I um, did, but I, I kind of wanted to just, um, I suddenly had a thought that um, maybe uh, what's missing in the conversation in terms of agents of change is, is also those that are seeking reparations and claiming objects back. And I was thinking about um, going to certain museums, uh, uh, I won't say what museums, but um, the fear of um, Chinese uh, government state sponsored um, museum, uh, I don't know what the name is, but they're basically going around the world and taking photographs of Chinese uh, objects in museums um, to trace, you know, um, whether or not there's a reparation kind of claim that can be made for them. And, and so this as well becomes a quite a very crucial kind of um, force, I think, um, in this discussion. But yes, quickly, I suppose what I wanted to do was just to talk about um, how slow how sorry my child is behind me doing something i don't know what he's doing can you quickly if you want to attend to him we can come back no, no, but don't put your computer on you'll spoil my wi-fi um uh what was i going to say you had been talking about the, the whole question i think very importantly in relation to these other audiences if in yeah, terms well, of people that, talking about reparations, which is the point that you wanted to make before you were going to go on about to talk yeah. to us about the images. What I was thinking of is how slow um, museums are, incredibly bureaucratic and so slow. Um, and how, um, and I just wanted to give an example of a kind of a case study of a museum that had gone through a discussion, um, this is probably 20 years ago, to re-display their ethnographic collections. Um, this is Brighton Museum. And so from ethnographic collections, they became um, world art collections. And so if I just show an image, it's very, um, yeah, it's kind of clear what you've got here is on the right hand side, you've got the World Art Gallery. On the left hand side, you've got 20th Century Art and Design Gallery. And I was going in there to do a project with um, trying to engage the Chinese community in Brighton with the museum. Um, it was funded through um, an Arts Council uh, audience development grant, and it was put together by the World Art Gallery. And this is where I think what I'm trying to say is how um, there are such deep set uh, processes and divisions within um, museums that sometimes work as impossible to move forward. So when you suddenly do get a movement, it's kind of incredible, but who is it led by? In this particular instance, what I wanted to sort of show was that the, the what had been called um, ethnographic art became world art. Um, but in the world art gallery, all the walls are red and earthy colored, right? And in the 20th century art gallery, uh, art and design, it's all white walls. So it's like modernism versus world art. Um, and as you dig down a bit deeper, you realize world art means Africa, Asia, and non-West, and 20th century means Europe. Um, and when you go um, behind in the stores, this new terminology is not reflected in the stores, which is still holding on to the old terminology, which is non-Western. So non-Western had been revamped to become world art. Um, and prior to that, an even older display that was found in the stores is, you know, kind of Oriental states and barbarous tribes and Roman Republic and Re Empire. Um, and thinking about this, and it sort of just reminded me how in Brighton in uh, the First World War, the Indian and Sikh armies, the so wounded soldiers were put in the um, Royal Pavilion because they felt that the Indian and Sikh soldiers would feel more at home in the pavilion, which is a kind of pastiche of um, kind of Taj Mahal with interior chinoiserie design. Um, and so this kind of constant othering and um, polarizing and kind of, you know, kind of creating these bounded sort of um, things is reflected, it continues to be reflected in what's being done. Um, and how do, we, how do we understand that then? How do we understand whether or not decolonizing is a sort of superficial um, redressing of terminology or is it actually a real deep down dig at the systems that create um, this. And that's, for me, perhaps the, the rub at the moment.
that's fantastic that's fantastic Erica and thank you for sharing those images because it brings us right into right into the heart and I think many of us would have been to to uh Brighton Brighton Museum and other museums where a lot of these these questions are still being played out so thank you for really that forensic view because I think some of these questions go much deeper than just the surface exhibitions as 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 you showed us um, I'm not sure if Michael we can get the connection back to Michael because I did want to ask a bit about where the priorities lie but um, before I go into that I, I'm aware that questions are going to open for our audience uh, presently I think in uh, the next 10 minutes or so so please uh, I know we've got a, a, a varied and broad audience there uh, at the other end of the camera so please your questions questions are being uh, reviewed um, and they will be put to our panel so please be um, be free and be quite open about um, bringing your your questions forward and we'll be taking them into the debate within the next within the next few few minutes the chat will open in two minutes time I'm not sure if we can get back to to Michael but um, while we're waiting for can that I make I'd... a point uh, just in something what Erica was saying is that please okay do. David uh, it's just that one of the things that one notices when you get to my age, David is a lot younger than me, uh, is that, you know, this area of discourse always seems to be in a developmental stage. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, now. It always seems to be in that, you know, the questions, the, the phraseology may change, the terminology may change, but the fundamentals remain the same. And that I find uh, makes me desolate. Whose fault is that? This is, I think this is our question now in terms of accountability. Um, whose fault? Maybe fault is not the right word. Who, who is accountable? Who should be made accountable for, for this, for moving the debate forward? As Nima, as you've outlined, not just the terms of the debate, but the very uh, relations and energy of the debate. The power structures is a question of power, isn't it, really? Um, I want yes. to ask this question in relation to accountability because we know at the moment um, that um, museums in our institutions are being challenged by um, tensions from coming from many different directions. They have their audiences on one side asking for certain things to happen. They have perhaps some stakeholders asking for certain other things to happen. They have government asking for other things to happen right at the, the top of uh, our our discussion this, this, this evening, Tamsin was outlining the, uh, the retain and explain policy. So there's a lot of vying tensions for these institutions. And from where we're setting, I'm really interested in where we think accountability lies. To whom should the institutions be accountable? Alice, what, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know who should be accountable, but I do really think that shame is a very powerful tool here. Uh, I talk about this in the context of it's it's really hard to name and shame institutions a lot of the time and like I understand that it can be very uncomfortable to try and do that especially considering how precarious this industry is and how everyone is constantly aware of the fact that you don't want to annoy anyone too much because they might be your next paycheck but I do think that when we see institutions putting out statements and putting out announcements that they're going to change their ways and do something different. And I mean, we saw a whole flurry of museums last summer announcing that they were going to take action in response to Black Lives Matter. And in particular, in response to the protests that sprung up around the death of George Floyd. I don't know what those museums have done with those statements. Mm. I haven't seen any significant transformations yet. And it would be very interesting to go through the records of who gave those statements and who put them out. We are, I think, many of us aware that in some cases, those institutions did not make statements until they were pressured by staff internally. That is a very common experience that I've heard from a number of institutions. And we need to recognize that as visitors and as educate as museum workers, we have power in that sphere as well. I also think that we have a duty to kind of hold these places accountable. Um, if you're a visitor, if you're a museum worker, I understand that it's difficult and frightening sometimes to put that pressure on the institution, but call them out, you know? 
<laughs> I'm not naming names tonight, but I would like to be in an industry where it felt possible to name names without fear of repercussions. Yeah, well, can we turn that around? Because we do have a question coming from, um, from, the, from the chat from our audience from, uh, I hope people don't mind being named as, uh, as LA, this uh, uh, um, uh, question is not so much about naming and shaming, but perhaps praising. Let's look at praise rather than blame. Are there anybody, are there any institutions that any of us either in our professional lives or in, in terms of just as ordinary punters that we, we would want to, to praise? Are there examples of things that have happened uh, that we've seen that we would, we would really want to um, hold up as, as examples of, of things that have happened? Um, David, I'm sorry, I know you probably, I hope you can hear me. I've had my hand up now, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to praise. Go for it, Michael. You, it's a bit of a stretch on the sound. I've got to be honest. So let's just give it a go. And then, are you there? Afraid. I am here. I can see. I, I am here. I'd just like to pick up on what Alice said about education departments. And specifically, I want to big up the education department in the National Gallery. They've, For my practice, the image of the Black in London galleries, they've been really, really supportive. Other galleries, not so. And to pick up on Alison said, they, they, they say all these great words, you know, Black Lives Matter, we're gonna make, we look for diversity in the collection and, 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 and what happens? Exactly. But the National Gallery, they've, they, they, they've, uh, they've opened the door and they've done some great things, great things. And I'll finish on this. I, this morning, I did a presentation for the National Gallery, for the, the um, Institute. They're, make, they're helping, the, they're spreading the word, you know, so respect to the National Gallery. Thank you very much, Michael, for that. That's really very clear. And I, I think it's really useful for us, who are so used to being critical, to be able to actually point out where there are examples of, of good practice. This, another question around best practice. We'll just take this before we move to the digital question. Lots of questions about the digital coming up. But there is a question about best practices and are there examples of, of, of best practice that someone could underline? Nima, I know, I mean, I'd want to say your work is an example of, of best pr practice, um, uh, but I don't want to put you on the spot in that way. I mean, in terms of the things that you've viewed, obviously you have a lot of opportunity in your, in your role, you're very respected in the field. Um, examples of best practice from you. Uh, well, I mean, uh, nothing, to, uh, I shouldn't say that of myself, but Bradford Galleries and Museums, I think was pioneering. And it was pioneering because people there before I was appointed you know, had that vision. Uh, and at this point, I would like to pay tribute to Paul Lawson, who, you know, not uh, somebody who, who understood uh, the, the, the intricacies of colonialism, but had a so, so, sort of ethical system that, you know, really, we've got this population in Bradford, we are in the midst of this population, and we need to be doing something. So he then prioritized both the acquisitions budget and the exhibitions program to be slanted towards this area before I was appointed. So I think, you know, quite often people get written out of narratives, usually people of color. But in this instance, I would like to pay tribute to both Paul Lawson and also the person who took over from me after I left, Nilesh Mistri, uh, because quite often I find that people talk about my contributions and he gets overlooked. And he actually, you know, quietly, doggedly, you know, perhaps, when there was less glamour at that point, carried on building the collections, was passionate about it, and did important exhibitions. So, so sorry to be parochial, but I did leave Bradford a long time ago. So, but these are two people, I think, you know, I would like to say are examples of good practice at times, you know, when it was not fashionable to be so for Paul Lawson and for, for Nilesh, you know, when he was uh, on his own in a sense. I mean, he had plenty of support, but, you know, at, at the same time, there was something, a bit of my shadow over him, but he carried on. And I think that takes courage. <laughs> I, I think it always takes courage to do work in these in these situations, Nima. I think you're quite right. I'm I'm grateful to you for yes, for yes. pointing to specifically to specific people. I don't think it's parochial at all because I think generally often these strategies get too abstracted and we don't actually focus in on specific locations. And this is 
one of the reasons why Erica, I enjoy your work so much because you do like to focus in on these very specific locations and, and invite us to think about um, what's happening there. I'm gonna to put to you and ask uh, Erica, there's a question in the chat here from Isabel, who's asking about memory and lived experience in creating new spaces. Um, I wonder if that speaks to some of your preoccupations about the role of, of lived experience and memory, not just professional strategies, which are important, but memory and lived experience in, in creating new, new spaces. Uh, you may need to unmute yourself, Erica. Yeah. Um, I'm not so sure I'm so engaged with that. I think for me, this idea of memory and lived experience um, in my relationship, in terms of being an artist and work in museums, one of the things I found quite problematic is that as an artist, often you're brought in as an extension to this idea of um, the anthropologist's lo uh, local informant. Um, so the artist becomes the sort of mediator to record and represent the lived experiences of others. Um, I'm not so keen on sharing my own personal lived experience. Um, so, so for me, that is problematic. And actually one of the pieces of work, um, thinking historically as well, sometimes that lived experience is not in the record and it's not in the archive. Um, so it's difficult to actually deal with the lived experience and subjectivity because it's not been recorded. So all I can do perhaps is to um, highlight the gap um, and the hole and the omission um, that's there to make that visible. Um, and what I find is that actually people want the story. They often want to know more about the story and the subjectivity, but it's a question about um, kind of in a way asking um, asking what can you ask from a, a archival document? What can you take from an archival document? How do you use it? And whose voice are you going to um, activate to try and, and do that? Um, so it's more complicated for me than memory. I did see a question on digitizing and I did think I wanted to say um, the issue for me with digital repat repatriation is that often museums are doing it as a way of continuing to solicit and um, extract um, knowledge um, as opposed to returning. So they're not really returning, it's actually um, continuing a kind of um, one-way process. Um, so that's my, my take on digital. Um, but at the same time, I, I benefit from it. So you don't have to go around the world and do research in these archives and museums. You can see so much on, online and it's quite incredible. But the key thing maybe we're not addressing is um, whether we need museums, whether we can dismantle them. And I want to make a shift from, because I've been talking about museums that kind of stem from a kind of colonial um, interest in resources, flora and fauna and, and um, ethnographic materials and thinking about the art museum. And I'm thinking about the art museum in relationship to me as an artist doesn't service me. Um, and I would like it to service me. Um, and maybe that's what the art museum should do is should service artists is one way of thinking about it. And then the other thing, rather than servicing collectors, um, cause often that's where history of art seems to, for me to be um, uh, where the relationship between the history of art collecting and museums, the artist is sort of outside of this. They have no agency um, in that. Um, what do you mean by wait. servicing? I know we've got other questions and we will come to the digital question, which I'm going to put well, to Alice. I have an issue servicing? with space. I don't have enough space in my life. Make the museum take my work to look after my artwork. Um, I don't know. It's like sort of, you know, there's a premise that um, we're not challenging, which is why we even have these things. And often I see, so in Singapore, the National Museum was only developed about seven years ago um, as a celebration of our independence. And it replicated, even though it was um, exploring how to be a post-colonial museum, it replicated many of the tropes that can't come before it. Um, mm. So in a way, there's not a real departure. It's the same, same, but slightly different. I'm glad you introduced uh, Singapore there, Erica, because I was in lucky enough to be in Singapore uh, some some years ago, not that long ago, and, and did note from the National Museum actually the use of technology in the Singaporean institutions is quite notable, and the ways in which technology can be seen as sometimes an alibi for 
not taken on other kinds of questions which are more structural questions, which I think may be somewhere um, resonating with, with, with what you're saying. But before we come back to that, Alice, this question about the, the digital and technology, art history quite famously transformed by the invention of, or the use of the camera and photography. I mean, where would art history have been without uh, photographs, without the old slides, and now the revolution of um, a PowerPoint, obviously most um, people uh, watching or sharing this evening with us will, will may well have lived through that uh, transformation or may actually be on the other side of the, of the divide, who knows. But more and more transformations through technology. And as Erica was pointed out there, that technology has enabled us as historians, critics, curators, and artists to, to work, but pro produces certain problems as well. The question I think from, from within the chat is um, whether, and this is from Anthony, is would technology um, accelerate decolonization? He refers to things like 3D printing. Um, but do you think technology has a role to play here? Uh no, I don't actually think it's that helpful. Um, I think often, I, I would agree with Erica that digital repatriation is often a way for museums to sort of pass on the responsibility of actually doing anything with the objects that they hold. And there's this sense that, you know, if you send a scan of the photograph, it's fine to keep the object. And I don't think that's correct or appropriate. I've also seen examples where Museums have used the digitization or the replication process as a way of exerting control over these objects in the new realm of, you know, digital reproduction or copyright and that sort of thing. And there have been a number of examples, uh, I think particularly in the US, where replicas have been supposedly repatriated or returned to their communities with this sort of duplication process that actually just becomes a further way of controlling the object. I think if there's a sense of collaboration, it's possible to have a really interesting technical conversation. I know there have been instances in Australia, for example, where digital work enables remote communities to access objects that they sort of geographically and physically couldn't get to otherwise, but that needs to be a step on the process towards actual restitution. It's not, it's not an alternative, it's, the first process, you know, having a having a digital conversation can be your introductory into this is what we have, what do you think we should do with it, but it needs to ultimately end in real restitution. I This is something that I see museums and galleries sort of latching onto as a way of postponing <laughs> the actual real work that needs to be done in a number of cases. It's sort of a complicated technical me method of procrastination when it comes to actually engaging with the objects that they hold and the responsibility that therefore these institutions have to the communities that created and own those objects. Thank you so much, Alice. I think that's very clear. I mean, obviously, when we, we're thinking about museums, we have to think about those responsibilities to the, the communities that created them, also to the, the communities in which those objects have meaning, the spaces where the meaning was curated. But also when we're talking about accountability, of course, there are many audiences to which the museums are, are accountable. And we've got a question in the chat here from, from Sandy asking about a very different kind of audience, the press. So what, what one does with the press? I mean, the press is a very varied spectrum, as we know, we have a free press in this country, so it's a varied spectrum, but maybe I don't know, I'm, I'm putting a slant on the question to, to be pointing towards certain uh, more vocal uh, aspects of, of, of the press. But I wonder, Michael, I don't know if, we, if you can come through with this, but if we can't hear you, then we'll go to, to Nima to kind of talk to us about um, what, uh, what you think museums ought to do or how institutions ought to respond, uh, respond to, to the hectoring from certain sections of the press, which is uh, yes. the, the quote. Yes. When I first acquired an Anish Kapoor for Bradford Museums and Galleries, turning the world inside out, I was feeling quite chuffed. I was feeling very proud that we'd managed to do that. And then uh, it was a fallow period and the Daily Mail ran an article about how you know, lottery money had been given to this strange object uh, when veterans who had applied for lottery money you know, uh, to, to visit war graves had not been uh, funded. Of course, they were two entirely different pots of lottery money. 
And until then, the local press, that venerable organ, the Telegraph and Argus, uh, were planning to write you know, a really upbeat piece on that. But then they saw the Daily Mail piece and then decided to change tack. And overnight, I became public enemy number one. And they also you know, quite sort of divisively went to different members of the community, didn't give them contextual information. And uh, you know, obviously got the knee jerk thing, like you know, the streets of Bradford need to be cleaned rather than acquiring these works. But that was quite an, uh, you know, a hard uh, lesson for me. Uh, but then this is why I think our connections, this, this, these roles are always very stressful. And I always tell people that I'm younger people who I mentor, build up your networks and don't just build up the networks in your sector, make sure they come from a wide range of people. I got a lot of moral support from these people, sat it out. And it is really the darndest thing that today's outrage becomes tomorrow's treasure. Because when, you know, a, a few years later, when the Anish Kapoor was going away on a long-term tour, uh, uh, the, apparently the local paper was, you know, up in arms as to why the people of Bradford were being, being denied access to this. But the press is a tricky beast. And I will confess that I feel, I would feel very nervous because just in terms of, you know, the amount of stress it can impose on one person. And, you know, we talk about responsibilities, accountabilities, make no mistake, quite often it devolves onto one person who may not be the head of the organization when things go wrong. You know, in that case, I did have a lot of support, I have to say, but I have seen it happen to others, you know, and so it is difficult uh, to be a tall poppy with a press that has uh, sometimes to me, it seems a weird agenda. I haven't fully understood it. Uh, and uh, so, so that is one of the things, <laughs> one of the experiences, which was a hard one, I right. must say. Thank you for, you know, for sharing uh, for sharing that uh, that Nima, and particularly this this whole idea that you know yesterday's outrage becomes tomorrow's treasure. I think that's those are words of words of wisdom. It appears that we've got Michael Michael back now. So let's just see if we can just uh, kind of follow on from that question, Michael, with a, another question that's come in from the chat, which, which relates to that. I mean, uh, Matthew is asking this question around, I, I guess it's the other side of solidarity. Nima, you were talking about building solidarity and support and the solidarity and support you had around you going through that, that particular crisis or, the, or, or those problems. Um, and Matthew's saying, well, we can assume that there are certain people around us who will support what we're doing in terms of decolonization. But how do we convince those who don't believe in it? How do we reach those people who are strongly against it? What, what kinds of strategies or approaches do you think that we might have to try and address those people? Michael, maybe if we've got that connection to you, maybe you, maybe you, can, you could come in here. That is, a, that is a really challenging question. Challenging question, because I would argue some people's mind is set. Those journalists that Nina spoke about were ready to write something positive, and then they saw the Daily Mail had gone against them. You can't, that kind of mindset is a populist mindset. You can't convert that. What I would argue, I would argue, is that, the, 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 um, something that um, Alice said about technology and digitization, she was not too much in favor of it. So, but like the other side of technology, I see technology as enabling in terms of the communications that we can do, despite what's happening to me tonight, the opportunity you have to respond to pieces through social media. This is intimidating to some of, some, some of these museums. And if we do it so quickly, they'll respond. Where there was some, some of the, in, their, um, in, their, in the restaurant and the, the, there had some despicable paintings and they respond, oh, I'm, I'm going again, I'll be quick. They responded to it only through, through the pressure of social media. So I see technology as enabling the, the masses, those interested souls. And it's a two-way street. I see the museums using that technology to, to talk back, to become much more interactive. So I, I see it as a very positive thing. But as for those people who are against the things that, that, that Nina and I, you and I stand for, we're not going to convert them. You know, let, let, let's talk about those who are on our side and build up that those forces. You're never going to convert the Daily Mail or the, the Telegraph. Other people to work on it. 
Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Michael. As, uh, I, I think that's a very strong and very clear strategy, and it's really always important to be clear in, in strategy. Um, I'm going to ask this question, move to this question about education, which has uh, come from, from Natasha. Um, I'm going to uh, go to Alice first and then to you, Erica, because Erica, you obviously you have this uh, strong relationship to education, but I'm only going to you, Alice, first, because you spoke about education earlier. You spoke very specifically about education departments in museums, but I think Natasha's asking a question more broadly about education and whether there ought to be um, some connection in relation to school curricula, to school curriculum, and what's happening in with that interface perhaps between schools, museums, universities, you know, having a more joined up picture about education. Can we put that responsibility yet again on top of teachers who are obviously very busy doing all kinds of things, not least uh, organizing corona tests for for children as we speak. Um, what would you think about this question about schools curriculum and schools taking having a role in this? I would like to see schools take a role in this. Uh, I'm not in favor of a fully prescriptivist curriculum, but I think that there needs to be a greater sort of obligation on schools to engage with these histories. I'm not also saying that teachers should just be like told that this is the new thing that they have to do and expected to immediately manage it. I would like to see support <laughs> for teachers and that means training and resources and funding made available to the educators who are doing this work. I think in my experience, I've had conversations with teachers in primary and secondary education who've said like, yeah, I'd love to teach my class about this, but I have no idea where to start. Because if you were educated in this country, there's a very real chance that you never discussed the history of the British slave trade or the abolitionist movement beyond everyone loves Wilberforce. And there's this overwhelming absence when it comes to talking about colonial history in this country. I think that is changing. There are incredible projects like the Black Curriculum and some amazing work being done primarily by activists to provide these resources to schools. I think it's highly unlikely that we will see the government play a role in this anytime soon, but it's important to recognize that educators and teachers have a kind of, have a role to play in this, you know? That means we need to support them. I think that there's a lot to be said for a kind of, collective response to this. I know educators in museums and teachers who've on their own volition like worked together to share resources and that's really important. I'm not in favor of anyone doing work for free when there are institutions that should be supporting and protecting them but sometimes we need to take a position of solidarity more than anything else to make sure that this information is available and accessible. I yeah, I feel very strongly about this. Um, I would like to see universities play a role in it as well because they have the research and there are plenty of students who are interested in sharing this information. I think that there needs to be a greater sort of synthesis between these very separate sectors, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary education, museums and galleries, political activism. These are all very interwoven uh, fields and that means we need to talk to each other. Um, school teachers, like, personally, I'm always happy to help if I can. If you want a list of paintings that I think are useful as classroom prompts, I'm always very happy to provide that. But that's something where often the kind of let's do our week on the history of colonialism gets outsourced to the museum in a way that they are not prepared for. I That's think the answer to all of this is always going to be funding, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, we live in a capitalist society with a government that doesn't believe in funding the arts or education. So there's always going to be a limit on what we can do there. But I know there are plenty of other people who are happy and willing and able to provide what they can to make this possible and to support teachers in that work as well. Thank you so much, Alice. I mean, you actually also responded to another question uh, from Lucy who was asking about resources, but you, I think you responded to that 
eloquently in terms of talking about this importance. Again, I think there's a theme around solidarity definitely emerging across the discussion this evening in terms of asking how we can begin to uh, share resources and make resources ava available uh, available between us. Um, I, want to, I was going to, Erica, ask you your thoughts about the education, but I, 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 there's another question coming up, which I think might, might be something for you, certainly in relation to the dynamics of displays. Um, Sheridan is asking about how you think the dynam dynamics of displays actually affect the, the divisions. Uh, and I think this very much obviously is reflecting some of the, what you're talking about in relation to, to Brighton. Um, what do you think could be done in relation to uh, the aesthetic and spatial organization of, 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 uh, of these museums in terms of trying to address these questions from that, from that point of view? Mm. I, um, I think there's been a kind of um, push for museums to revamp their displays. Um, I'm, I'm, when I'm speaking, I'm thinking both in terms of Singapore and I'm thinking of Britain, it's sort of like um, these two spaces and perhaps more so in Singapore, the kind of uh, revamping is quite, um, uh, it, it, you know, you don't have years and years apart. <laughs> it's constantly being done. Um, and something I noticed was, you know, certain kinds of um, aesthetics that are brought in um, by bringing in um, specialisms from Canada and, uh, and England to Singapore to then create kind of the designs for the um, exhibitions. Um, I'm sorry, it's going to be a bit garbled now, but I'm sort of th thinking about it's a huge thing and it needs to really be, um, I suppose, each exhibition needs a kind of engagement with how you display because the way in which you display is the way in which you're sort of editing and creating if you want to sort of I have an idea of knowledge. So um, it's sort of in a way, what do you want to do curatorially? But often what I find quite interesting is that um, museums may also have another department, which is called, you know, the design department and also the press department. And so the curatorial department isn't just uh, completely on their own on this one. Um, and in some places, they're actually dominated by the design um, aspect of it. Um, and so it's not as simple as saying, what is the curatorial kind of ethos and aesthetic that's being used and the display um, kind of regime. It's a whole kind of several different departments and whether they're all speaking as one and they're all engaged in the same kind of um, interests or determination in relationship to decolonizing, um, you can't be sure because they've got different publics and the different um, things they're working towards, I think. Great, I think that's really useful. I think we've got to think Can about I this in a, a, I'm actually gonna put a very direct question to you, Nima, but please come on, come into that, uh, that, well, that, that, that point. What I was that when I project directed um, a Connect for Cartwright Hall, uh, you know, as an external curator, uh, there was one theme that we were looking at, which, which was uh, people. And we were looking at the, the way the whole thing was, these were the permanent collections were being used to tell succinct stories, both you know, the, the British permanent, the European collections, as well as things that came from the subcontinent, the Caribbean and Africa. So we, we used all of them and we displayed them alongside one another as long as they made intellectual or narrative sense. And then I was confronted with one display, which was the bust of the principal benefactor for Cartwright Hall, Samuel Cunliffe Lister and his partner, um, Holden, Isaac Holden, and then this huge statue of the eponymous Cartwright, who had, you know, an 18th century clergyman who'd done some kind of a, an invention with textiles. And we were already exploring the connections between the subcontinent and Britain in terms of textiles. And I must pay tribute to Brenda M. King for her book on silk and empire. Because at that, until then, I had not fully understood. We, everyone knows about, you know, the Asian community in Bradford, many of them who came there in the 1940s, the, the first wave, or not quite the first wave, you know, to work as productive and, uh, you know, efficient people in textile factories. And people thought that that was where the connection began. But Lister, who had actually paid for most of Cartwright Hall, had silk farms in Northern India and also he used the, the waste silks to, to make these wonderful sumptuous silks, which then sold for you know, huge prices within Europe. So that was one thing. And the other thing that the Brenda M. King told me was that the, the technology college, Bradford Technological College, the students there had been hugely influenced both in the late 19th century and the 20th century by textile techniques and design vocabularies 
from India, from the subcontinent. And so now what do we do with these three things? We can't de-install them. It would be a huge engineering feat. So we commissioned Abdul Rashid from India, a master block printer, to do this massive textile as a backdrop. And that textile referenced pattern books from India. It referenced pattern books from Bradford. And it made all kinds of connections. So you know we were able to tell that story. So we also hung a number of other textiles that were able to make these connections. And I think you know it seemed to work quite powerfully. And so therefore, three not terribly attractive pieces of marble suddenly took on a different kind of life and got contextualized. And they were not the dominant narratives anymore. They were, you know, multiple other narratives. Wonderful. Sorry, David. <laughs> yeah, no, that's there. really useful. I, will, I, I, I always want to hear these stories about the specific engagement, specific interventions. We, I think we learn so much from them. So thank you for sharing that. I do want to come back to you in a moment, Nima, because there is a, a specific question for, I think a bit of a sage advice is being sought by, by someone amongst our audience. But I want to come to you, Michael, just to ask this question about someone in the audience who's uh, saying that they're an arts enthusiast, they support the arts, um, but they want to know in which ways they, as a member of the public, might be able to get uh, engaged and actively support decolonizing uh, in institutions. Wow, that's a great question. There's lots, lots of ways you can do it. You know, you can. You can the first question, uh, the first thing you do is, as, as Alice, Alice talks about, about funding. You can support the Black Curriculum and other institutions. Go online. They're, they're always looking for for support. But also, you, 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 you can support people like Alice, Alice and myself that's worked, that we're doing in, in institutions that, so, that, so these institutions can see that their work is, that this work is valued. That's important, making the connections, supporting people in the community. Because these we and others are actively involved and it's, it's through support by people like, I, I'm sorry, I missed your name, but you being with us and being part of us, give us momentum to grow our, our practices. So getting involved and getting involved, and, and, and great if you put money up front, that's fine, but equally just attending courses, there's so much going, happening now. There's Black History Walks, there's, there's um, uh, Avril Nansen's Walks. There's lots of ways you can engage and support. I'm thinking particularly about the, uh, the, the Black community in terms of the Black um, access to um, m museums and, and the like. So no, the, the, there's a number of things you can do. And also, if, if you just Google Black History Walks or Black History in, in London, there's, there's lots going on, really exciting stuff, innovative and a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Michael. I actually think that may be, unfortunately, the last question that we can take. I'm going to see if we, uh, if I get another message from uh, the team supporting us, um, whether there's time for one more question, but actually I don't think so. Um, oh, we've got the word from, from Tamsin. We can have one more question there's there's so there's so much here to to choose from but i think there's a very personal uh question that that has come in and it's somebody asking for some advice and they're asking about um what would we recommend to a newer museum professional who enters the field with goals of being an active agent for change and is working to decolonize their institution but is met with reticence putting it nicely, met with reticence from above, from the directors, curators, and admin who form the old guard and don't see the need for change. I think we've all lived through this in one way or another, whether it be in museums or universities or other institutions, but what sage advice might we give? We've only got a few minutes, so um, I'm just gonna ask for a, a quick line from each one of us, please, to, to give, um, what what advice would you give to this to this this new professional, uh, Alice? The the square's on you. So let's okay. start with you, and then we'll just go around. Um... Yeah, I mean, I've said this before in other contexts, but I think don't forget that you are an activist. Like, no matter how much pressure you're under at work to tame yourself and play along, you still have power outside of the institution as well. You don't leave that at home when you go to work, but I understand that sometimes it's necessary to play politics. If you have to, don't forget that this is still something that you can do. Don't get so suckered into the institution that you forget 
that you ever had that position in the first place. Like, Thank, yeah. thanks so much, Alice. Erica, a couple of a line from you of words of wisdom. Yeah, I think um, I've been a long time in my university, always thinking that I would somehow get to a point where I understood it and therefore could work with it better. I think you need to scrap that. Just build your path, stick with it and find people that will come along with you and, and then do it. And don't wait for the ones above you to give you somehow some permission. They're not going to. You have to pave your own way. Fantastic. Pave your own way. Michael, words of wisdom, please. I, 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 I coach young boys and, uh, to be the best they can be. And what I always tell them, your network is your net worth. And I, 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 get you, I urge people to start networking as soon as possible. And again, coming back to technology with the internet, you can network uh, with, with that senior level. Quite. Okay, networking. Uh, Michael, I think we, because you were losing your connection and we're also losing time. Well, that's so. it. We'll just say your network is your net worth. Um, we're all nodding at that. Uh, Nima nodding as well. Nima, your, your words, please. Uh, well, I think also positioning yourself so you have a profile outside of the museum by writing in, you know, journals, uh, you know, articles, reviews, also taking part as much as possible in public debate and also have a little bit of focus in what you are pushing within the museum. Don't forget, decolonizing is not just about the past objects. It's also about the present. And I am seriously concerned about the lack of artists represented, uh, artists of color represented in public collections. So maybe that could be something of a hobby horse, not a hobby horse, sorry, that's a horrible term, but something that somebody, you know, people should focus on because it is really quite a crisis. Wonderful, thank you so much, all of you for this debate. Um, we only have minutes left, so I'm going to hand over back to, uh, to our hosts, but thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Um, my few words of wisdom, just for anyone, um, think about yourself, You've only got so much energy, choose your battles. Row, row, row your boat, gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is like a dream. Over to Townsend, who is our host for this evening. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Thank you all so much. And thank you, David, particularly in your very smooth handling of the various technology issues tonight. Um, the Courtauld MA students would like to take this moment to give our huge thanks to um, at Leila, Alice and Acacia at the Courtauld Research Forum for all their help at, in organising and setting up the debate tonight. Um, we'd also like to thank Sam Maguire and Esther Chadwick for their insightful guidance and our tutor Jackie Klein, um, who the, who's the leader of our courses term, for her continued support and advice. Um, and of course, a huge thank you to our wonderful speakers, Erica Tan, Al Alice Proctor, Michael Ohojuru, and Nima Puvaya Smith. And once again, to our chair, David Debosa. We are so grateful for our panelists and our chair's time, their work, and their insight into this rich and critical subject. With this, we must remember that while words and debate are important, decolonizing uh, work entails action. We hope that this evening's discussion has been informative for all. To echo Ben Ockrey's poem from earlier, we hope that such discussions can encourage deeper analysis, reflection and decolonization action through various ways and channels in each of our everyday lives. Thank you again so much for coming and wishing you all a very good rest of your evening. Thank you.